we are often warned of the risks of hitchhiking with strangers. But what happened to Sofia Lusha when she did this very same thing? And with the police not interested in her disappearance, what would her friends and family do to retrace her path? My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Sofia Lusha, and with over 2,500 requests for me to cover this case, it's Coffeehouse Crime's most requested case to date. The case of Sofia Lusha brought pain and civil unrest across the country of Germany for several reasons. Today, you will find out why. But just to let you know before today's video, I post solved, unsolved and strange cases here on a weekly basis. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So, pull up a seat, grab a coffee and sit back. This is the case of Sofia Lusha. Today we're adding a new country to the map of coffeehouse crime. Welcome to Germany, known for its bratwurst, pretzels, and of course beer. And more specifically, welcome to Leipzig, the most populous city in the eastern German state of Saxony. Leipzig is best described as a vibrant and exciting city. With a population just shy of 600,000 residents, it holds an abundance of bars, restaurants, and shops which attracts many students looking to develop their education. Leipzig is rich in diversity too, with many cultures and ways of life coexisting within the city's borders. In fact, it is the fastest growing city in Germany, and its growth in the past 10 years has mostly been with thanks to its inward migration. And a final interesting fact, but Leipzig also contains Europe's oldest coffee house, Adam Heinrich Schütze officially opening Coffeebaum in 1694 which is located on Kleine Fleischgrasse 4. So, it turns out that coffee and Leipzig do indeed go hand in hand. But unfortunately, that is not what brings us here in today's case. If you remember my comments on students and diversity, those two characteristics are much more relevant to our story. One of Leipzig's residents went by the name of Sophia Lusche, and she was 28 years old in the year of 2018. Sophia was a reliable and honest student, seeking to obtain her master's degree in German studies, also known as Germanistic. Being a late addition to the family, Sophia's siblings were a lot older than she was, and in response, she was very mature for her age. Graduating from Max Rege Gymnasium in 2010, Sophia obtained an Abitur, Germany's most prestigious pre-university accolade. And while at school, Sophia found her voice in politics, obtaining her own desire to fight racism. After graduating from school, Sophia then moved to Bamberg to study German, and during her time here, she became a student representative for the University Senate, even appearing in video interviews for the occasion. Sophia was a very diligent young woman. In 2014, she stood up as a candidate in the Bamber City Council, where she demanded more affordable living conditions, cheaper rents, and much more. Friends often wondered how Sophia managed to keep her life together. She had a degree, university senate role, jobs, hobbies, friends, her boyfriend, and other usual engagements to look after. Yet she would consistently manage to do them all. It was in the year of 2015 that Sophia graduated from the University of Bamberg and moved over to Leipzig to begin her master's degree. And while there, she would often visit her family back at home and volunteer in various charity projects. One of these projects was called The Kitchen With No Borders, where Sophia would often visit the Greek island of Lesbos to create meals for those less fortunate, usually from a refugee background. A lot of these refugees were from Morocco, and through her various visits she would learn the basics of the Arabic language. On the 14th of June 2018, Sophia made plans to travel back to her parents' home to celebrate her dad's birthday, which was the very next day. The family home was in Amberg, roughly 180 miles from her student apartment in Leipzig. And so, the journey wasn't a simple A to B. But it was the middle of summertime in Germany, and the weather was warm and sunny that afternoon. Roughly 71 degrees Fahrenheit, to be exact. Sophia left her apartment at around 4pm, saying goodbye to her flatmates before taking the S-Bahn train from Leipzig to Schkuditz West. The journey was only around 10 minutes long, and afterward, she walked away to the Aral gas station, taking another 10 minutes to get there. There's not much to note about this gas station. It has a McDonald's, a car wash, a place to buy gas, 
And apparently, its schnitzel and fries aren't too bad either. Another benefit, particularly to Sofia, was the vast amount of traffic that came through this gas station. And it even had a resting bay for a dozen truck drivers. This was important to Sofia, as she had intended to complete the remaining 160 miles back home through hitchhiking. Understandably, hitchhiking is perceived to be quite dangerous. Allowing a total stranger to be in full control of your physical location is a significant step in randomised trust. But even hitchhiking in particular holds a negative stigma. Statistically speaking, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. In fact, over 99% of all hitchhiking goes by without any problem whatsoever. And when we're talking about the more severe types of crime, that likelihood is significantly smaller than 1%. Sophia trusted these figures. In fact, she had hitchhiked this route many times before with her close friend Eva. Sophia understood the marginal risks, but she felt the benefits of saving money, meeting new people, and living an adventurous lifestyle far outweighed the likelihood of anything bad happening. The plan was to hitchhike from this gas station to a place named Hersbrook, where she could then complete the remaining 23 miles by train, before her father could pick her up from the train station. And that was the plan, at least. But Sophia... She never showed up. Sophia told her parents that she believed she would be home around 11pm. But as the hour came and went, her parents, Johannes and Liz, immediately knew something was wrong. In fact, their worries had been growing since around 10pm, as Sophia had never answered her mother's text message, which had asked her what time she would arrive at the train station. At 1.05 in the morning, Johannes drove to the train station to see if Sophia had made the last train. If she didn't make this one, this really was her last chance for the night. And unfortunately, she was nowhere to be seen. Sophia's family were obviously worried and in a great amount of fear. They had no idea where she could have gone to, and they were aware that she had hitchhiked to make her way home. But luckily, they had an early lead. As a safety precaution, Sophia had shared some of the driver's details to family and friends at an earlier stage. In a telegram message, she wrote, I am currently hitchhiking with Bob, a Moroccan truck driver from Leipzig to Nuremberg. He even gave me a Moroccan pipe as a present. Sophia had made several attempts to catch a ride from the Aral gas station, but to begin with, she had no luck. Some had refused to take her, and some simply couldn't due to the lack of space in their car. This kind of thing takes time and patience. But while observing the situation and realising she wasn't getting very far, Bob decided to approach Sophia and offer her a ride. Bob was a 41-year-old truck driver on shift from Morocco, working for a company named Ben Trans and he and his blue T460 truck were on the way back home when he encountered Sophia. And coincidentally, they were both heading in the same direction. Using a combination of English, German, and simple body language, the two were able to understand each other enough to make simple conversation. And so, with that said, Bob understood Sophia's requirements. Sophia seemed to trust Bob, or at least enough to be able to accept a ride from him, as witnesses confirmed that they saw the two walk towards his truck before catching the southbound on the Autobahn 9. But that is all family and friends knew about Bob and his involvement with Sophia. Many questions still remained. Where is Sophia? Who is Bob? Is he aware of her disappearance? Or, even worse, is he directly involved? With all of these questions burning in the back of their skulls, the race to track Bob down began. At 6.45 the next morning, Sophia's parents called the police to report their daughter as missing. But the answer they received was less than reassuring. The operator responding with, Your daughter is probably out getting drunk somewhere, which is why she isn't responding. The police did nothing. By 10.45am, another phone call had been made to the police in sheer desperation and worry. But this time, the operator suggested Sophia's father should head down to the local police station to initiate a missing persons report. He complied, but police were still sluggish in beginning their investigation. In fact, only two discoveries would be made by police that day. To begin with, police in Hamburg contacted the police in Leipzig, 
and after visiting Sophia's apartment, they realised that she wasn't there. So next, they attempted to call Sophia and track her down, but no dice. Her phone appeared to be switched off. Sophia's friends were growing more restless, and after requesting the police to check all surveillance footage from the gas station, the answer was no, and this resistance further motivated her friends to begin their own investigation. Not even 24 hours since Sophia's disappearance, they had printed missing persons posters, distributed them at several gas stations along the A9, garnered a total of 50 volunteers, and even found their first unofficial witness. This witness being a Polish truck driver, who had noticed Sophia entering a blue truck that held a Moroccan license plate. This truck belonging to Bob. Sophia's friends also requested Aral services to share the local surveillance footage, but due to data protection acts, this could only be examined by police. And again, police officers played down the situation, telling Sophia's friends to stop being hysterical. An officer would eventually look at this footage the next day, where he did confirm that Sophia had entered a truck with a Moroccan license plate. It also confirmed a description of Bob. But investigations would stall for an additional two days, as police couldn't decide if this case belonged to the state that she was a resident of, or the state that she went missing from. By Monday the 18th of June, three days since Sophia's disappearance, a Moroccan friend of Sophia's cousin called to the company which Bob and his truck worked for. The operator on the line was very helpful, as he confirmed that the truck was on its usual route back to Morocco, and he even promised that he would try to put Bob in contact with Sophia's friend, Eva. And at 3pm that very same day, Eva received a phone call. It was Bob. The two spoke for around 15 minutes, Bob even admitting to Eva that he had given Sophia a ride. He said that Sophia seemed fine as she departed, but she actually got out of his truck as planned in Lauf and he would even send a picture of his ID to Eva as soon as the phone call was over. Bob followed up as promised, with an additional picture of him, his wife, and his kids. Eva felt horrible after speaking to Bob. It seemed as if her suspicions over him were entirely false. But I mean, let's face it, even from the very beginning, it seemed as if Bob was the prime suspect, or at least he may know where Sophia had disappeared too. Throughout all this panic, Eva had made so much of Bob's details public, and now through all this disarray, that seemed unnecessary. She was now afraid for her safety, and putting it bluntly, that was all her fault. However, Eva should have trusted her gut instinct, because although Bob had successfully persuaded her, she was in fact right. Following a rather lazy weekend, it was on Monday when police had finally decided which state was responsible for Sophia's case. It was Saxony. The police of Leipzig started building momentum in Sophia's case, using the details that Sophia's friends had so diligently discovered on their own accord. They reached out to Bentrans, requesting for the truck's GPS data to be sent over for official examination. And by that very same evening, this data was in the hands of police. This truck data made the rounds. Going from Saxony Police to LKA Saxon, the State Criminal Investigation Office, to Bundeskriminalamt, the Federal Criminal Police Office, to Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization, and finally, to the North Spanish Police Department. At long last, Spanish police would finally begin their search for Bob, and although he wasn't necessarily a suspect, he was their best shot at understanding what exactly had happened to Sofia. But in a sudden turn of events, they would find him without even trying. At approximately 4.30 on Tuesday the 19th of June, a fire was reported outside the Spanish city of Yeen. The cab of a semi-trailer truck was burning heavily, and that truck belonged to Bob. Spanish police would eventually find him, where they would then learn that Bob was a fake nickname. His real name was Bujima Lamrabat. Bojima claimed that his truck's engine had been damaged, and that this is why it had suddenly burst into flames. But either way, investigators were interested in speaking to Bojima, mainly for Sophia's sake, but now also due to the truck. They took him down to the local police station for questioning. Bojima told investigators the same story that he had told Eva, but during this same interview, officers couldn't help but notice the faint blood stains on his shirt. So, out of curiosity, they took this shirt in for forensic analysis. But before results even had the chance to come back, 
a very sudden and stark discovery was made. In the municipality of Asperena, which was 450 miles north from Bajima, a body had just been discovered in a ditch next to the motorway. The body was of a young woman, and tragically, this body belonged to Sophia Lusha. On the 21st of June 2018, exactly one week since Sophia's disappearance, she had finally been found. Sophia's family and friends were beyond devastated. All of the effort they had put in to find Sophia safe and well was unfortunately in vain. GPS data from the truck would eventually confirm that Bajima had in fact driven through Asperena, and that blood which was found on his shirt, unfortunately that was Sophia's. Despite bluffing to Eva, Bajima was Sophia's killer all along. Not much is known about Bajima. Born in 1977, he grew up in Morocco with his grandparents under poor circumstances and neglect. He never had the opportunity to receive proper education as a child. But moving into adulthood, he obtained work as a painter, quarry operator, and eventually a truck driver. In the late 1990s, he eventually met his wife while touring in his truck, and together they would have four children, who were three, 11, 14, and 17 years old at the time of Sophia's disappearance. But even after leaving a troubled home in his childhood, his own home as a husband and father would also come with some issues. Bojima described himself as someone who is short-fused and who would freak out easily, which actually seems to be an understatement, as allegedly he had beat his wife on multiple occasions. One incident involving him cutting his wife's chest with a knife, which ended up requiring four stitches to heal. But what exactly happened to Sophia? With the GPS data, surveillance footage, and mobile data, it would paint a rather damning story. The story begins one day before Sophia even arrived at Aral, when Bajima was at another gas station in Leipzig. It was noted that while here, he snapped multiple images of two young women leaving the bathroom in short clothing. And not even two hours before meeting Sophia the next day, Bajima was busy in his truck taking pictures of, well, let's just save himself inappropriately. At 6.14pm, shortly after meeting each other, a surveillance camera captured Bajima and Sophia walking towards his blue truck, and by 7.47pm, the two had stopped in Berg, located in Upper Franconia. Bajima and Sophia are seen entering the Shell gas station, where they then bought coffee, and Sophia's body language through surveillance footage indicates that she is comfortable. The drive continued for around an hour, before Bajima stopped his truck at a dark and lonely rest stop in Sperbesvest. Something serious and unexpected must have happened here. The truck remained static for three hours. The truck then made its way to a shell pit stop in Laufhersbruck. Bajima then bought multiple cans of beer, which were eventually found by investigators, and analysis confirmed that Sophia's DNA was found on one of these cans. Bajima then spent his night in the parking lot of ABL, an electronics manufacturer located in Lauf, just outside Nuremberg, and as part of his work schedule, 18 pallets of electronic accessories were loaded into his truck in the morning. He got rid of two beer cans and Sophia's headphones before leaving at 10.52am. By now, friends and family had already endured their first night of fear and worry without Sophia, and unknown to the rest of the world, she was still with Bajima in his truck. It is very likely that she was tied up in the footwell, and, if at all conscious, she would undoubtedly be in immense fear. Bojima then drove four hours to Augsburg for his next pickup, stopping six times at various rest stops. Undisclosed surveillance footage reported that he appeared to be nervous and restless, and Sophia was nowhere to be seen. By Friday evening, Bojima had crossed the border from Germany into France. He stopped a further six times in the next day, before eventually stopping at a rest stop in Claude Bonnier of southern France. Due to the Sunday driving ban, Bojima remained at this rest stop for 24 hours. If only the police had taken Sophia's case seriously in the first 72 hours, as undoubtedly, they would have had a good chance to locate him during this period. There was even still a probability that Sophia was still alive. At 10.59pm on the 17th of June, a surveillance camera captured Bajima entering a French gas station. He added 119 litres of diesel to his truck, before also purchasing 4 litres of petrol, which was filled into canisters and purchased on a separate receipt. I wonder why. Sadly, we don't know when exactly Sophia passed away, 
But at around 6am on the 18th of June, which was four days and 1200 miles since Sofia disappeared, Bojima arrived in Asperena, located in northern Spain. He then placed her body in a ditch, before fleeing the area, only to return later in the day to set on fire. And, as you already know, he was found beside his burning truck the very next day. With all of this accumulating evidence, it is no surprise that Bajima Lamrabat was officially arrested under suspicion of murdering Sofia Losha. And Bajima's trial would begin exactly one year later, in July of 2019. According to Bajima, and at least to begin with, both he and Sofia had got along very well, making great conversation. But after reaching Spierbes Fest, everything changed. While he was cleaning the truck's mirrors, he looked through the window to see Sophia searching through his belongings. This enraged Bajima, and in response, he hit her in the head with a nutwheel wrench. And in a panic, he left the truck. While the court could agree that some sort of physical attack happened at Spierbes Fest, they couldn't agree on his motive or his manner. To begin with, they believed that his motive was that he accepted the ride with Sophia because he wanted to have sex with her. And after she rejected his advances, the situation turned violent. But Bajima firmly rejected these claims, and there was also no evidence to suggest that any assault had occurred. There were several complications into agreeing the time of Sophia's death too. One autopsy report suggesting that she died in Spebes first. But the other report highlighted the can of beer, which was confirmed to have Sophia's DNA on it. And this can of beer wasn't purchased until the next day. And Bajima's clothes were still clean during his visit to ABL, which didn't happen until the next day either. And this indicates that the crime scene must have happened at a later stage. But one thing that everyone could agree on is that Bajima had in fact killed Sofia Lusha. And on the 18th of September 2019, Bajima Lamrabat was officially found guilty for her murder. He was therefore sentenced to life in prison, with the possibility of parole after 15 years. Neither autopsy report found any evidence to suggest any form of assault, so Bajima was only found guilty for murder and for grievous bodily harm. The judge described Bajima as an aggressive and emotionally unstable loner with no friends. Not content with his life and proven to react with violence, the judge also highlighted that he was a man with less than average intelligence, scoring an IQ test of only 81. Savage. But the judge wasn't the only one to deliver serious shade that day. Bajima accepted his sentence in silence. He then added that, as soon as he is a free man again, he won't ever go back to his family. And when asked what about his children, he shook his head and said, they have a mum. Following Sophia's death, and due to the progressive mindset that she had for migrants, far-right supporters and anti-immigration campaigners began to use her name in protests to reveal the irony of her death. This was against the wish of her family and her friends, and caused great frustration to those who knew and loved Sophia, who would then react with equal force back. The police would also take a hit to their reputation, and both police states would admit partial failure for not taking Sophia's disappearance serious from the outset and taking too long to begin a thorough investigation. The sad thing is, doing better in either of these things could have resulted in saving Sophia's life. But through all of this discourse, it is easy to forget the one thing that truly matters. And that is Sophia Lusher. Sophia was a diligent young woman. She had a bright future ahead of her, with so many goals that she was yet to achieve. She was positive, tolerant, progressive, and she loved life. With her heartfelt honesty, tireless passion, and her openness, her social circle was huge. She met many like-minded people along her journey, many of them who would shift from an acquaintance to a friend. She put her trust in many, and unfortunately, that trust would be betrayed. Let's not forget the incredible tenacity, strong will and determination of Sophia's friends, who throughout the days of worry and terror, made every single attempt that they could to find their loved one. They faced this challenge alone. Tracking down Bajima without the help of police was the equivalent of finding a needle in a haystack. Yet regardless, without falter, they would achieve this.
Hey again, and thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. And thank you to Razor Velta for suggesting this case. A huge thank you to Yana for helping with translations. Honestly, you helped bring so much depth to this story. And also, a thank you to all of you who helped suggest this case. Sophia Lusha had so much to bring to the world. And despite hitchhiking being relatively safe, she was very unlucky to find Bajima. So, what are your thoughts on hitchhiking? Do you trust its randomised luck, or do you believe that it's never worth the risk? Please share your thoughts in the comments section down below. That just about wraps up today's case, so I will be back again next Monday. But until that moment arrives, look after each other. Goodbye.